All right, everyone. It's uh, six ten. I guess we gotta get us get us started. Uh, uh, so uh, this is my grand round talk. I'm Reza. I'm one of the graduate institute presidents. I'm I'm glad finally being kicked out of this program after eight years. <laughs> so this is my very first lab coat back in 2011. Still there. Uh, I was hanging around in the clinic, uh, and uh, I still you know kept it. So uh, we gotta talk about. Uh, Something that we don't really talk about during our residency and we don't encounter these cases, you know, uh, frequently. So I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the session, uh, you know, we can have a better understanding of what this entity is and how to, how to approach, you know, patients who come in with this issue and how to manage those. Uh, so I have no relevant disclosure. Uh, so talking about uh, what Barosinusitis, aka aerosinusitis, is. So it's a condition, uh, you know, describing the varying degrees of sinonasal inflammation and pathologies that occurs in the context of, uh, you know, sinonasal cavity being exposed to an uncompensated change in ambient pressure. Well, what does that mean? So, uh, uncompensated change in ambient pressure happens when you are either flying or diving, uh, or so forth, so so on. And so we talk about it a little bit more. Sinus barotrauma, or aerosinusitis, has been known since early development of aviation medicine. Uh, however, it, you know, during World War II, it was further delineated, and uh, the pathophysiology was explained in aviation medicine uh, literature. Uh, it was better understood. Uh, and then since then, there have been, uh, you know, numerous papers talking about uh, different pathologies of barosinusitis. Uh, you know, I've, I'm showing some of these papers here. And over the last 50 years, there have been additional causes of barosinusitis, aside from, you know, f flying and diving, which are the most common culprit. There are also uh, papers showing that uh, gaseous general anesthetic agents, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, even, even high-pressure uh, high wind exposure, just staying in high... high, high uh, uh, altitudes for a prolonged period of time, even car traveling with car uh, uh, in mountains, uh, submarine decompression, and even, you know, there are case reports that uh, nasal blowing and even vigorous falsava maneuver can cause uh, sinus barotrauma. Uh, so, talk a little bit about prevalence. So, interesting that, you know, when you look at the literature, the estimate of the prevalence uh, in divers and pilots is actually pretty high. We're talking about 34% in divers and uh, 20 to 25% in pilots, uh, they can experience uh, uh, sinus barotrauma. And then uh, uh, having sinus inflammation during uh, flight or diving, uh, such as allergic rhin rhinitis, actually can further increase the prevalence of barosinusitis in pilots or divers. Uh, there are rates being reported as high as 55% in commercial pilots if they fly when they have an acute uh, uh, sinus infection or it's like, you know, uh, allergy season and they're not taking uh, precautions when they're flying. Uh, and also uh, can be seen in up to 34% of uh, high performance fighter pilots. Uh, so talking a little bit about pathophysiology. So uh, Boyle's law, uh, which states that in a given temperature, the volume of gas varies inversely with the pressure, is highly applicable to understanding what the pathogenesis of barosinusitis is. Um, and it's, it's similar for like other barotrauma in head and neck. Uh, you know, barotitis is also one of the common, most common ones, but uh, my subject of uh, uh, ground run attack is uh, mostly, mostly focused on uh, barosinusitis. So in this uh, cartoon, you can see uh, when the Series so and in this uh, piston, when the when the pressure goes up in a given temperature, as you can imagine, so the volume, the, the gaseous volume decreases. So this is highly applicable to understanding pathophysiology of uh, uh, barosinusitis. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, so the paranasal sinuses are labyrinthine air-filled spaces uh, bounded by thick, fixed bony uh, outer walls and uh, thin, pliable inner internal walls. So, under normal circumstances, uh, when there is no sinus issues or there is no uh, anatomic abnormalities, 
you can imagine if uh, you bar barometric air pressure within sinus cavities uh, should easily uh, equilibrate with the pressure in the surrounding nasal passage. So if this is like an open, nice, wide conduit, you know, this, uh, this, difference, this difference in the you know, pressure intrasinus can easily uh, equilibrate itself in the, in the intranasal cavity. Uh, so talking a little bit more about that, uh, so, so what happens exactly? Like well, what we told so far, we're just going to apply that uh, uh, into real cases and real world. So just imagine when you're flying during ascent in an aircraft uh, or after, you know, ascent after a deep dive. Uh, so how many divers are here? This is And how, I know one professional pilot. Do you have any more? All right. So like I said, have you experienced sinus bar trauma during your flights? No, no, thank God, no, but you have to take a lot of precautions. I don't fly yeah. when, I, when I have a congestion. Yes, yeah, so we're going to talk about stuff that. Here, I don't fly. Exactly. How about divers? No. Never? Don't dive when you got a cold. There you go. Okay. So, uh, so this is what's going on here. So when you're ascending in your aircraft, when you're taking off, this is ambient pressure here. So you're going up. This is ambient pressure. So it decreases. So based on the Boyle's law, this gaseous environment expands, right? And uh, this starts putting some pressure, you know, onto the sinus wall. So in the normal situation, this easily just equilibrates with the outside through this, uh, you know, ostium uh, here. And then, whereas during uh, descent, what happens is uh, the environment or ambient pressure increases. So that actually causes decrease in the volume intrasinus and kind of squeezes the sinus. So in the aviation field, these terms are, uh, you know, uh, being used uh, commonly. They're called uh, uh, squeeze injury or reverse squeeze injury. Also, reverse squeeze is called compression. And the squeeze injury calls decompression. So you are quite familiar with the decompression injuries in our, you know, general medicine population. You know, literature we remember from medical school that we have something called decompression injuries but we never talk about compression injuries but this is what basically happens so when, you, when you're descending here ambient pressure goes up and intra intra sinus gaseous volume actually squeezes uh, you know decreasing size decreasing volume whereas here it increases in the volume all right so how can we apply uh, to uh, to understand, to better understand what's going on. So here, what's going on here? So when you get uh, barosinusitis or barotrauma, so the culprit is usually, as our divers and pilots, you know, discuss, there is something going on with the sinus in the first place. Either, either you know, you've had a cold or something was going on and you didn't take enough precaution. So this is inflamed. So this normal, natural, patent ostium that usually equilibrates, uh, you know, the pressure difference between uh, intrasinus pressure and the, and the extrasinus pressure is, clo is closed off like that. So when you're ascending, so ambient pressure decreases, intrasinus pressure increases, and instead of just easily just uh, equilibrizing the pressure, it actually starts putting pressure on the sinus mucosa to the point actually can cause mucosal edema and rupture. Whereas when you are descending, same scenario, uh, ambient pressure increases, intrasinus volume decreases and kind of pulls the sinus mucosa in and squeezes the sinus. So this pathophysiology is called a uh, squeeze barotrauma, as you can imagine, so it's squeezing the sinus. Whereas, or decompression barotrauma, whereas this one is called de-squeeze or reverse squeeze barotrauma, also called compression injury. So these are, these are two main, uh, you know, terms that we're going to use uh, throughout this, uh, this, this talk. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit. Uh, and then this is the squeeze one or decompression sinus bar barotrauma. So it happens... Uh, when the ambient pressure increases, when you're diving actually, not, not, very, not when you're resurfacing, you're actually diving. 
So you, you can get the decompression sinus barrier trauma or decompression uh, auto, you know, trauma. All right, so we talked about this and this. So again, you know, when you're talking about decompression or squeeze sinus barrier trauma, uh, you know, it results from uncompensated centripetal pulling forces. Uh, and then uh, this can range from this can range from the injury can range from mild mucosal edema to complete uh, avulsion of the mucosal surface, which is shown here. You can get actually submucosal hematoma. We're going to review some cases uh, when when we get to the radiology part. All right. So uh, uh, you know by understanding the pathophysiology of uh, varus sinusitis, now we're going to move on to clinical presentation. So what type of presentation, uh, you know, we see? Uh, so these are basically three different scenarios that patients uh, uh, come in with. Uh, acute barosinusitis, recurrent acute barosinusitis, and chronic barosinusitis. And the primary distinction between these terms uh, uh, is the frequency of episodes uh, and uh, if, whether or not if there is any symptoms between acute episodes. So moving on, acute barrel sinusitis is the most common form, actually. It's an isolated episodes of sinus-related pain and inflammation that lasts only for a few hours uh, to days, to few days after exposure to an identifiable cause of change in ambient air pressure. So these folks are, are uh, people that basically come to you and say, we had, we had, you know, uh, we flew and we had a cold and then we feel the crack or popping in our sinuses, and since then it's just been bothering me. It's just killing me for a few days. Uh, and we asked them, have you ever had something like this before? And they said, no. So this is, this is the presentation of acute parasinusitis. So they've never had you know, such an episode before. This is, this is the only episode that they've had. They, they usually you know, uh, have cold or, or, or flu during their allergy season and didn't take enough precaution when, when, you were, when they were flying or diving. Uh, so there's uh, several uh, papers actually reporting the presence of coexisting upper respiratory tract infection that Dr. Chirago and Dr. Sejadi uh, mentioned. So they never fly or dive when they have a cold. So this is basically what's going on. Do you have an isolated acute parasinusitis? You've got a very bad cold. You've never, you haven't taken enough precaution. And then you fly, and during ambient pressure change, you get this sinus injury. Uh, so uh, literature basically shows that frontal sinus is the most commonly affected one uh, with a report of 68 to 80% in different series, followed by maxillary and sphenoid sinuses uh, uh, for acute barosinusitis. Uh, the most common symptom that uh, these patients present with is a sudden onset of pain is most uh, frequently the reported symptom. And it's often actually very localized to the affected sinuses. They come in and tell you, oh, I have this forehead pressure after I flew like last night, and it's just really, really bothersome. Uh, interestingly enough, epistaxis is the second most uh, commonly reported symptoms. Divers are familiar with epistaxis. It can happen when you are resurfacing fast and when you are not, uh, you know, doing all of those... Uh, uh, maneuvers that you're supposed to do, you can actually get epistaxis. It's a sign of uh, decompression injury, uh, bar 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 trauma. Uh, so again, patients uh, frequently describe the feeling of cracking or popping sensation in the sinus region, which is thought to be the actually con consequence of uh, mucosal stripping here and or submucosal hematoma that happens during decompression injury or squeeze trauma. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the literature, there are case reports of, uh, uh, you know, cases that present after sinus paratrauma present with like anesthesia over V2 branch, dental pain, excessive lacrimation, and there are also like horrendous cases, case reports level that patient presents with meningitis. Uh, there, was a, there was a case report that patient presented with septal abscess after a sinus paratrauma, pneumocephalus orbital, orbital floor fracture, and even blindness or a couple of case reports after, uh, after sustaining uh, acute uh, sinus paratrauma, patient uh, became blind. Uh, moving on to recurrent acute parasinusitis, 
So this is, a, as you can imagine, uh, this is when basically your patients, uh, you know, come to you and say they have recurrent acute attacks uh, of barosinusitis or bar trauma. So same thing, it's, an, it's, a, it's acute, uh, but it happens on a frequent basis. And the key here uh, to differentiate uh, acute, recurrent acute barosinusitis from, uh, from the next clinical presentation, which is called chronic barosinusitis, is actually they are completely asymptomatic with phenethism. So everything happens only when they fly, only when they dive, or like they're, they're staying at high altitude, they're traveling by car in high altitude, and they get this type of symptoms only, and only uh, when there's ambient, uh, ambient pressure change. Uh, so these patients actually may have higher incidence of underlying sinusal inflammation and anatomic uh, <coughs> variants such as septal deviation based on uh, a review of uh, literature. And then we have chronic barosinusitis. So this is the most severe form of barosinusitis. It's often confused with chronic rhinosinusitis, second due to under underlying sinusal inflammation, due to long-standing duration and nature of symptoms. And some people actually use these terms interchangeably. Um, and then, uh, so a detailed history with specific attention to occupational or recreational causes of barotrauma is essential for the proper diagnosis of the condition. And then recent studies uh, have shown that recreational and professional divers uh, in, uh, indicate that repeated barotrauma may actually cause this condition. However, caution must be used when evaluating these studies to avoid equating correlation with causation. So it's still really hard after reviewing all of these papers. Uh, I couldn't really say that uh, is the underlying chronic rhinositis is the culprit or being you know, exposed to chronic uh, barotrauma actually is the cause in the first place. But there, there, are, a couple of, uh, there are a couple of papers that, you know, that, uh, that um, gave me some clue that actually the recurrent barotrauma might be the culprit in the first place, such as this paper uh, that they studied. Uh, uh, they basically, you know, they basically uh, did an MRI and some uh, recreational divers and also in a normal control population. I mean, you can never do this in study in the US. This was done in Turkey. Uh, but so interestingly, you know, they saw that uh, the rate of uh, mucosal thickening in, uh, in the control group was, uh, I'm sorry, in the recreational diver group actually uh, two times more than the normal population. Uh, here's another st uh, study. Uh, this study also shows um, that um, there is actually a direct proportional relationship between the, 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 the prevalence of chronic rhinositis and number of dives that you perform. So, uh, you know, so there is a difference between uh, as far as the sinus basically inflammation, chronic inflammation, there is a difference between a person uh, who has dived 200 times and a person who has dived two times based on these uh, studies and that MRI studies. Uh, so in contrast, acute barosinusitis, chronic barosinusitis often presents with, uh, bilaterally and involves numerous sinuses, uh, and then recurrent severe pain during ambient pressure changes, but also they have that ongoing sinus issue year round. So that's the difference between chronic barosinusitis and recurrent acute barosinusitis. <coughs> it's very similar to our usual you know, uh, sinusitis classification uh, that, you know, we describe acute, recurrent acute, and chronic. It's similar to that, uh, with that regard. And up to 72% of these patients uh, show other symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis down in the road, too. And uh, we talked about this, so there is still not enough evidence to conclude whether a pre-existing CRS uh, causes this problem. It's actually vice versa in this subgroup of patients. Uh, Talking a little bit about radiologic findings, so acute sinus barotrauma can present with a wide range of uh, imaging findings. Uh, in many cases, there might be actually no radiologic findings. As you can ev imagine, this is just one episode of acute uh, sinus barotrauma, uh, whereas there are also case reports and case studies that shows that uh, after this barotrauma, they, they can get complete opacification of one or more of the paranasal sinuses. Um, this study looked at the MRI uh, 
of uh, you know people that presented with uh, sinus barotrauma, and on MRI, uh, you know, they basically found out that uh, after after sustaining an acute barotrauma in a patient with no no history of uh, previous episodes, you can see uh, you can see a lesion in the sinus. Uh, which is hyper intense uh, both on T1 and T2. So what what other what other lesions uh, can basically present with uh, uh, you know hyper intensity both on T1 and T2? Maybe one of the one of the residents. What I'm trying to get to is actually this is one of your differential diagnoses when you see a, a, a hyper intense thickening or opacity both on T1 and T2. So, mm -hmm. You can see. That's exactly right. <coughs> yeah, and cholesterol gran granulomas actually can be can can uh, can can basically uh, uh, demonstrate the same findings. So this is this is uh, you know good to know that you know if you see something like this, let's say if you had another imaging a few weeks ago or a few months ago, a few years ago, didn't have this problem, you can just go ahead and ask about this. Something to think about that uh, acute barosinusitis can present with this finding. So this is thought to be uh, due to submucosal hemorrhage, you know, during squeeze injury, uh, that can actually, that can actually, you know, show uh, this uh, hyperintensity on both T1 and T2. Uh, some other radiologic findings, so talking a little bit about recurrent acute barosinusitis. So this is very similar to our recurrent acute sinusitis. And, you know, the idea is the same. So they don't have any symptoms in between. They get recurrent acute sinusitis. Here is just the context a little bit different. They get all of these episodes when they are uh, in the environment with some uh, ambient pressure changes. And uh, it's important to, uh, to carefully evaluate uh, uh, to consider imaging if, if patients, you know, present with you with recurrent acute sinus barotrauma, at least to get a CAT scan. So I'm going to present two cases here. Uh, these are cases uh, that were done by Dr. Nayak. Um, so this case is a CT scan of a, of a patient um, uh, who basically presented to our clinic with the, uh, several episodes of bilateral maxillae and uh, it might pain during commercial air travel. He was a frequent traveler, so he presented basically with this, uh, with this presentation, this CT scan. Uh, maybe one of two, what do you guys see? Tyler, what do you see on the CT scan? Uh, <coughs> this is a coronal uh, NCT. You can see looks like bilateral conjugalosa. Um, Decent size of pure turbinates. Otherwise, pretty pretty normal scan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good. And then uh, you probably want to comment on the you know this uh, outflow track bilaterally. It looks pretty narrow. I mean, it looks pretty squeezed here by this contrabalosa. Uh, so what would you do for him? So he 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 came to us. You know, uh, he was getting to the point that he would consider not flying at all. Uh, would you operate on him? No. <laughs> Why is that? Why no? I mean, I, I don't see any evidence of, of maxillary disease. Mm -hmm. Agre agree that the output track is narrow, but I don't, I don't really see any yeah. radiographic evidence. I see. So this basically just, you know, just... Uh, uh, as, as we talk about this, so this falls into a category of recurrent acute barosinusitis. You would even operate on someone like this when they present with recurrent acute, you know, sinusitis. You know, you tailor your treatment, you can offer them treatment, you can start with, you know, minimally invasive approach for these patients. But we're going to talk about that too. In barosinusitis, actually, minimally invasive approach are not applicable. So we're going to talk about that. But so... He basically, you know, was experiencing pain during ascent, so it's a reverse squeeze, and was associated with bilateral V2 numbness and tingling. That was that was the way that he presented. Uh, as 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 you as you correctly mentioned, so he has bilateral contrabalosa. It's a OMC narrowing uh, without evidence of because of thickening, as you mentioned. 
So uh, we talked to him about, you know, the CAT scan and things that we can do. And this was around the same time that we were, you know, doing this uh, literature review. Uh, so we, we thought about balloon, ballooning the sky, but then we found a couple of papers that they basically, I'm going to actually uh, talk about those papers too. Uh, but they were, those papers were against actually doing balloon sinoplasty in the context of sinus barotrauma. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. So we went ahead and uh, did the surgery, did the septoplasty, did the uh, uh, ITR, did a conchabulosa resection, did a bilateral maxillary and total lipoidectomy. And then, uh, so his symptoms of barotrauma sinus is completely resolved after sinus surgery with the absence of symptoms confirmed even after five flights after surgery. And we followed, followed him for more than a year and he never experienced those symptoms uh, again. Uh, yes. Could you get away with balloon sinus? Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about that, but uh, <coughs> so far there's not much evidence uh, using balloon uh, for barotrauma cases, and they, 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 the idea is that bony espicles that you know that you cause when you are actually doing balloon sinoplasty that can be floating around and causing actually more mucosal thickening during ambient pressure changes. Hmm. So. Balloon sinoplasty so far, based on literature that we have, is not recommended, but we definitely need more studies. Yes? What was the medical management? Uh, medical management for this patient? So do you usually do medical management for cases of recurrent acute barosinusitis? So just, you know, barosinusitis apart, you don't have any, you almost have a negative scan, you don't have a sinus disease. You are making decision based on the symptoms and frequency of the symptoms. So clonase and saline sprays wouldn't have helped him. So he was actually already using that. He was, <coughs> yeah, he was using that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on to second case. So this is a known patient to our department. Uh, we have like news about this patient. Oh, yeah. You know, all all over our. Internet side, and he was actually the main reason I got interested in topic. I saw him, Dr. Danvers Clinic, and I saw him, Dr. Nags Clinic. I was like, "Well, what are you doing here, sir?" I was like, well, that's "What's going on?" Uh, so he is a very nice F-16 fighter pilot. He was grounded due to acute episodes of facial pain and whistling sounds that would uh, originate from somewhere between eyes, uh, on mainly on high speed uh, descent. So it's like a squeeze type injury, right? You're descending. Ambient pressure increases. You're squeezing the sinus volume. So, uh, Tina, what do you see? He has a significant <coughs> left-sided septal deviation with um, compensatory hypertrophy of the right inferior turbinate. Mm -hmm. I think he has um, some small plancha on the side. He's looking mm -hmm. off within the plancha as well. Mm -hmm. um, bearing bilateral ostomy. <coughs> Uh, but otherwise, minimal because of the Yeah, right now. All right, so as you said, significant septal deviation, small left contrabalosa, that kind of comprises, you know, uh, compromises the left uh, OMC. So this, this scenario of recurrent acute barosinusitis was also treated with a septoplasty and SMR and bilateral maxillary and anterior ethmoidectomy to improve sinus patency. So after four weeks, uh, you know, he was uh, back on active duty as a fighter pilot. And we, and we you know, we, we did follow up on him, and he was doing fine last time we checked on him. He was, uh, he was back, back on duty after, after this minimally invasive procedure, I would say. Question. Yes. So you brought up the minimally invasive procedure. My main question is how do you determine which sinuses we address, apart from the ones that... Perfect. We're gonna we're gonna get to that. We're gonna talk about that in management. I just wanted to bring up these cases, these two cases, uh, to talk about the radiologic findings in recurrent acute. We're gonna get to the management. We're gonna talk about that in detail. Let's see, am I on time? Oh. Okay. All right, and then um, uh, so radiologic changes associated with chronic barosinusitis are similar, you know, to those seen in chronic rhinosinusitis. It's really hard to differentiate. You basically see bilateral mucosal thickening, all of the sinuses that could be involved. We can see patchy opacification. So uh, uh, scan is not a way to differentiate between barosinusitis, chronic barosinusitis, and chronic rhinosinusitis. And again, it's really hard to say which is the cause in the first place. Uh, talking about management now, 
So again, as Dr. Sajadi and Dr. Shrago mentioned, they never fly or dive and they have coal. But what if you really need to fly or you know, you're, really, you're really eager to go diving? So this is what's going on. So different medical treatments have been proposed for management of acute parasinusitis. Uh, it ranged from observation to use of anti. So this is when basically uh, the incidence has happened. Like you've experienced the issue. So this is not, you're not, you're not then, you're, you're not up to the prevention. You're talking about the medical management. So patient presents to you, you had one episode of severe forehead headache or cheek, head, cheek pain, uh, which, you know, lasted for, for a day or two and basically present to you or present to a, you know, his, his family physician. So, uh, so data on this thing is mixed, like whether or not to do antibiotics, whether or not to do decongestant, oral and steroid. Like what would you, what would you consider, one of three, let's say one of these folks come to you, Mike, you're in your rhinology fellowship clinic, <coughs> to you, two days ago he had this bad <coughs> headache, since then it's just killing him. Are you gonna are you gonna scan him? Are you gonna uh, are you gonna do anything? Only one scan him. Is he still having symptoms right now? After two days, yeah. I think. And pain being the only symptom. Pain. It's it's pain. Presumably from uh like beam and coastal beam around his sides out for the tracks. Mm -hmm. so I would probably go with steroids and decongestants. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a role for antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I don't know the literature. Yeah. But. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, yeah, so Based on review, this review, so isolated acute uh, episode can be successfully managed with just a congestion. So you really don't need prednisone, you don't need antibiotics, you don't need to do anything, uh, except if the symptoms linger more than a few days. You do the same thing, so again, same concept, acute sinusitis. We tend to, you know, over-treat acute sinusitis, but based on our ARS guideline, you don't need to uh, treat the antibiotics uh, unless you have, like, you know, symptoms have lingered more than 10 days, right? So same same rule applies here. So just a little bit of, you know, Sudafed, maybe you can try Afrin, some analgesics, and you get away. The role of antibiotics in steroids remains unclear. Uh, uh, so one paper said you, you may consider to reserve those for symptoms that persist more than 24 hours, but that was just one paper. The rest of the literature did not agree with that paper. Uh, so, and then, the second patient comes in and says, every time that I get this, that I fly, I, I experience the sinus bar trauma. So I think in these cases, you, uh, you, you probably want to have a lower threshold to scan them. So as we discussed, management, sort of like, you know, part of the management, part of, part of, uh, uh, part of the diagnosis for recurrent acute sinusitis is radiologic. So you want to make sure that there is no chronic changes. You see a clear scan and then you only see some like anatomic abnormalities. So you want to consider to scan these guys. Uh, and then in the setting of chronic virus sinusitis, the maximum medical treatment is basically the same. You do Flonase, you do steroid, you do antibiotics, you do all of those different papers in aviation medicines. Like one of them mentions about five day course of 100 milligram prednisone, a short course, other papers mention about just, just our usual 12 days flown A, saline rains for chronic virus sinusitis. One paper even, you know, mentioned about a month's course of antibiotics have been uh, suggested for acute, acute duty, active duty pilots. Uh, and then uh, a recent study uh, basically showed that 49% of divers with chronic rhinositis, rhinosinusitis, they respond really well to medical therapy and uh, could return to diving duties. But this is, there's again, just one paper that, that highlights the, the, the success of medical treatment in people that are uh, exposed to chronic uh, ambient pressure changes, medical treatment being effective when it gets to the point that you see mucosal thickening everywhere, you know, sinus mucosa is not really healthy, but there is no consensus on that. So surgical management. So the primary indication and the only indication for an isolated episodes of acute barosinusitis is if you are dealing with complication. Again, so there are case reports. There is one case that uh, you know, presented with septal abscess after just being exposed to barotrauma and a sphenoid, acute sphenoid sinusitis with just extension of the inflammation to uh, uh, submucopreconchial space and getting a septal abscess, 
or there's like orbital floor fracture, or there's like pneumocephalus, so like extreme, you know, complicated cases, case report cases, you want to jump on operating on these people. Otherwise, as you can imagine, one episodes of acute sinus burn, we definitely want, don't want to operate on them. Uh, as far as uh, recurrent acute sinusitis, so we presented two cases. So how, how do you tailor your treatment? You basically want to take your minimally invasive approach. You want to see what anatomic uh, abnormalities you see on the scan and what symptoms the patients experience. Interestingly, if you look at the literature, uh, you can very well localize which sinuses are involved during barotrauma. So if they only present with forehead headache, you know, you, you can take a look at the scan, but you can just tailor a treatment. But if they, they never had any cheek pain or they never had like occipital pain or, you know, the area between eyes are okay, you know, you can probably tailor your treatment to treat maybe just, you know, OMC or just frontal. But if they only <coughs> get like bilateral cheek sinus pressure, you can, you know, you can offer you know, max rentrosin, maybe partial ethmoidectomy. So you've got to tailor this. This is, the, this is the judgment call here. You have a clear scan. You're basically going by history uh, and then finding some anatomic abnormalities on your scanner and endoscopy. Uh, so we talked about this. Uh, targeted therapy, you kind of look at your CAT scan. You put the story and exam and radiology together and tailor your treatment. That's, that's, that's what we did for those two cases. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I actually asked that because you did a, a more in the first case. And yeah, really just had to exactly. So uh, <coughs> we were dealing with OMC, so that was, that was as, you, as you saw, that was like bilateral OMC was very narrow. And so I think the minimal treatment for bilateral OMC disease, like when, when it's narrow like that, you want to take that bullet down, do a little bit of partial ecmoidectomy too. Yeah. So I don't think that doing an antrostomy and taking down the conjugal would be yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. I think in our case, he was so, again, so he was complaining actually of area between eyes. So cheek sinus is an area between eyes. So we did tailor uh, to what, what symptoms actually he had. Okay? All right. And then uh, moving on to chronic uh, barosinusitis, so chronic rhinosinus. So this is basically a disease that you mostly see in... Uh, in, um, in um, uh, pilots, uh, commercial pilots, uh, uh, or, uh, or, or, or divers that, that dive like, you know, uh, professional divers. And so the role of surgery in patient-based, you know, uh, in literature, and these are a couple of papers that I'm quoting here, uh, is basically uh, the long-term success rate for uh, endoscopic sinus surgery in these folks is about 92 to 95%. So we're talking about uh, uh, fighter pilots that were grounded, and by operating on them, they actually get back on their duty. So, uh, and uh, uh, so as far as extent of surgery for chronic rhinositis, when you look at the literature, so a good number of literatures are coming from basically these authors, PJ Wormald, uh, Eric Witzel. So Eric Witzel is actually one of the flight surgeons, ENT surgeons uh, in Texas. So uh, he's, he's written like uh, numerous papers about this issue because as you can imagine, you know, he encounters his patients on a daily basis. And he did Dr. Wormald's fair fellowship. So that's, that's how like Wormald's, you know, got roped to this entity and has written like five or six papers on this. So they are recommending to actually if these patients get to the point that you see bilateral mucosal thickening, they're grounded, they, they go really aggressively. Like they treat these people with like, like most aggressive surgeries. If they're really grounded, they start with like draft tree. Uh, they really, you know, open up all of the sinuses and, uh, and they also have very good success rate. So this is a little bit different from our stepwise approach for our usual chronic rhinocytosis. That you start with like a draft 2B and then we may revise them, we may balloon them. So they say, because these folks are on constant, uh, they're exposed to constant ambient pressure changes, uh, you're not going to get away if you go minimal. You really need to open everything up here. Uh, so that's basically a view of uh, draft 3 here, as you can see. Uh, uh, so let's see, one of, one of twos, Milesh. 
Rustin, what do you see, Rustin, here? What's going on? What is this? Uh, it looks like they did a drop three. How do you say that? What do you say that? Uh, there's like a superior subdeckomy and okay. it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Empty nose syndrome. Yeah. And then what do you see here? What's going on here? Uh, is that the common cavity? I guess that's the, the endoscopic image. Uh-huh. Um, what is this guy? Is that the remnant of the septum? Yeah. yeah. And this is your crib reform here, huh? That's <laughs> and then this is your horseshoe, huh? So they're recommending to go ahead and do this, basically in pilots who are grounded. Uh, and, but some, some other folks there, you know, they, they still do their stepwise approach. They, they go, Let, we can start with draft 2A. And, and, uh, and if, they, if they recur, you can, you can proceed with draft 3. Can I make a comment? Yes. Can we go back? <laughs> I just want to make sure. I mean, this is definitely published stuff, but it also reflects the, the philosophies of the surgeons that are writing this in all aspects of CRS. So this is how they man they advocate for primary draft three for patients with things of polyposis and CRS. So there is a there is a skew here mm -hmm. that they would say that it works, so therefore we should do it. But I think that it sends a, a bit of a misleading message that less surgery wouldn't have been enough. Because if you look at what they're saying is a maximal opening should be attempted to prevent restenosis and recrudescence. Well, the reality is, I mean, if you think about Barrow-Sinus size, you're looking for equalization of pressure. So yes, if it scars over, you're not going to get the equalization of pressure. But if you do a clean, standard frontal sinusotomy, I'm not aware of the physics that says that that isn't enough to equalize pressure from above and below. You know, that, that's empty nose syndrome right there. <laughs> well, that's a different that's a different lecture. <laughs> but uh, I just I need to point that out. I'm not I would not go toe to toe with Wormald to you know out of respect for his opinions because they're well formed. But you just need to know that that's like a school of thought that permeates a lot of the writings of. And all people. of the ARS at every single meeting, there's a frontal sinus management panel including this, including on CRS, and there's an Australian panelist that advocates for a draft read as a primary approach, and a lot of other panelists in the different things. So like, you're not going to see us recommend a draft read for any kind of condition unless it's an extremely, you know, it's an exceptional condition, because I don't really believe that that treats ferro-sinusitis mm -hmm. better. I don't think many pilots in the Air Force would remain on flying status with that history. Yeah. They'd be grounded permanently. <coughs> Why would it? Because uh, they wouldn't be deemed worldwide qualified on an unpredictable map. You, you can't do uh, that drastic surgery and expect that if you had an emergent case that they wouldn't come down with some symptoms, especially with high performance like aircraft. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, onto balloon sinoplasty. So so why why would not you know specifically recurrent acute viral sinusitis? Why not just balloon them? I mean, minimally invasive. So 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 first off, any none of those uh, case series that are mostly actually uh, written by Dr. Witzel group and Dr. Wormel group. They didn't do balloon sinoplasty in cases. <laughs> and again, this is all, again, so data is a little skewed because they have a, just a very aggressive school of thought, as you said. But there is just one paper here that, again, of course, from that group that, uh, you know, there's, this is just a, a couple of cases that they, they did balloon and uh, uh, the results were not as great, meaning that they needed, they needed revision surgery after balloon. And they, they proposed that I, the idea of balloon, basically, you know, you're, you're fracturing some of these, uh, you're fracturing this, you know, outflow, and there might be some floating pieces in that, you know, conduit that you're making that, uh, that can be, you know, sucked in during that squeeze injury or reverse injury. So they say it's not great, but again, we don't have enough data on this. Like, no one has, has done a, like, a real nice case series or, you know, randomized clinical trial comparing you know, balloon versus, uh, versus a usual sign of surgery. 
Uh, and then prevention. So, Dr. Sejani, how do you prevent? Well, you know, for my barotitis, which is similar to this, I have a very restricted the plan. So, for three days, I have them one day before the flight, during the flight, and the day after the flight. We have Sudafed, Afrin, Flonase, and I tell them not to sleep during the takeoff and landing and chew and also try to you know, equalize the ears with the nose. So, I think for a three day regimen, uh, both Sudafed, Afrin, and Flonase. And nasal rinsing. So basically recommending whoever, whenever someone has like a cold or dealing with seasonal allergy and they need to fly somewhere, right. so they should preventively, prophylactically take something? Yes, if I've had a history in my patients, of, I think a otitis has been very successful this regimen, but it's just something I came up with like 15 years ago. Yeah, that's exactly right. So prevention part of the stock actually comes from the Barotitis literature. I couldn't find anything in barosinusitis. That's right. There have been papers uh, written on barotitis literature. But that's probably what you got to do. I mean, we talk about this. So 70 to 80 percent of acute isolated barosinusitis associated with just cold, URI, allergy. So you can just prophylactically take that pseudofed and afrin and prevent, you know, prevent uh, this problem. Uh, so uh, as, as you discussed uh, and I mentioned, so if the pressure change is unavoidable, uh, you can do oral decongestant before anticipated event, as you said, so before flying. And then uh, this is coming from, so this is, a, this is the Barotitis actually paper. And they recommend to actually use also have Afrin the, during the flight. And... Uh, if you feel any anticipated shifts, if you're ascending, if you're descending, actually spray your nose mm -hmm. to prevent. Uh, you know, this is definitely applicable to cases of recurrent acute barosinusitis. So back to your question, Mike or Tyler, about the medical management. So this is actually the medical management uh, extrapolating from uh, 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 barotitis <coughs> literature. So this is you know, basically what they recommend. And... Um, I think this is uh, this is probably a good preventive measure, and we have some real real life stories too. Yes, I, I tend to differ on using systemic decongestants mm -hmm. because on a long flight it's extremely dry, mm -hmm. and decongestants produce even more dryness. I think somehow affecting the ciliary clearance of the nose and the sinus tissue. So I do something a little different than doctor. I have them use uh, 15 minutes before the flight. I have them blow their nose, spray once in each nostril with Afrin. Wait 15 minutes. Now the nose is open. They blow their nose again. The second spray goes up the nasopharynx to gestation tubes. And perhaps if they don't have scar tissue or closure of pathologically of their osteoid may help that. And that's been working very well for me. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments on prevention? Dr. Wong, Dr. Patel? Dr. Patrini? <laughs> <laughs> I think the other recommendation... The other recommendation... I'm sorry, <coughs> specific about prevention, I'm, I'm not quite, I'm, I'm not done that. The, the other thing for <coughs> divers yeah. is recommended that if you've done any diving, you should not fly the same day. That's mm. right. Mm. That's right. I see. That, that's for that's right. nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's not for so, Yeah. Right. So anyone in the audience actually has him, him or herself experienced this problem? Oh, so it's, uh, it's not on her. What did you do, Kristen? What was what was your um, incident? I take, well, if I fly and I have like a cold or allergy. Can you speak up. Please? Sorry, I just I take pseudo oh. Okay. Based on your previous experience, yeah. what did you experience with that? Um, a lot of cheek and forehead pain and pressure. During ascent or during ascent? Um, more during ascent. Yeah. So that that's that's sort of goes along with the literature. That's interesting. Anyone, Dr. Most, what what did you experience? Uh, same. I actually was much worse during descent. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense from a physics point of view that it's, mm -hmm. you, when you have pressure in there, it's, it's valve-wise, it may force itself out, but getting it, you get a negative pressure to go in yeah. to relieve the pain is harder. It's afrin. Yes. My wife had ear pressure coming down from the mountains on a very sharp descending type road. So what we did with her is we went back up. Yeah, we went back down until she got pressured, and we went back up. And after about <laughs> half an hour, we were able to have her equalized. So that's a known technique, actually, in diving, right? You know, that's so right. If you really experience right. a decompression 
injury, you, they go actually dive back in. That's right. Uh, so, uh, so again, we studied, we talked about Sudafed, we talked about Afrin, and uh, so in summary, barosinocytes is a common, it's a common, really common, I mean, we're talking about 55% prevalence rate in pilots. But potentially overlooked, like how much do we talk about this? Probably we don't encounter these patients in our center. Probably flight surgeons, you know, see a good chunk of this patient. But something to keep in mind, something concerning your practice, if, you know, these, these folks present to you with a headache or things like that, one of the questions that you can ask, you know, what happens during ambient change? I've seen Dr. Patel and Huang asking this question when dealing with recurrent acute sinusitis. So that's just a question to keep in mind and ask people. Uh, when, specifically when you're trying to, uh, trying to understand if you want to operate on a patient with a clear CAT scan. So those are dicey cases, right? You have a clear CAT scan, you're going by history, there are like thousands and thousands of reasons for facial pain and headache, so how do you, you know, jump into conclusion to operate on these people? So this is one question, one sort of like triaging question that you can ask if, if there is any any change in the symptoms during ambient pressure, during flight, during, you know, mountains, divings. Uh, so barosinusitis, we talk about classification. Uh, so sinus pressure and pain is the most common symptom followed by epistaxis. And imaging is indicated probably for, only for recurrent episodes or chronic episodes. For an acute isolate, you, you don't want to scan them. It's, management is mostly conservative in acute cases. The surgery is indicated in... Uh, uh, some of the recurrent acute cases and chronic cases with good career saving outcomes based on the flight surgeon's papers. And I also wanted to say many thanks. I've been, you know, with this group for eight years now. And finally I'm being kicked out. Uh, Dr. Huang, this is the very first lab coat that, that you gave me. It's called rhinology. It's not even a doctor here. Reservoir is offshore rhinology. Appreciate that. Um, and then, uh, uh, so Alki, one of our previous fellows, uh, who is actually uh, worked with Dr. Wormald, also helped with this paper, uh, and uh, this was published uh, and then uh, presented at Cosm references, and this is hometown. Yeah. Happy to take questions. Did someone say empty nose syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> That's God. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, great presentation. Very practical. Um, I'm not familiar with that. The term chronic barosinusitis. Mm -hmm. Are there diagnostic criteria? Are Are you required to show objective evidence? Like, is it CT findings? Um, how do you make that diagnosis? Yeah, exactly. So uh, as, as, as I showed in my slides, uh, you know, mostly these terms are, you know, being used interchangeably. Uh, so there is no class, like, clear classification because uh, those chronic, like, extreme cases, you mostly see them in uh, flights, basically. Like, you know, flight, like, um, uh, like commercial pilots or firefighters, so mostly coming from Dr. Witzel group or Dr. Wormald group, working with divers. So they haven't proposed a classification system, but they say you basically see signs and symptoms of chronic sinusitis. The same, you can apply the same basically classification uh, system to these patients, but the only difference is these patients are professional pilots, professional divers. So that's the reason you know, this entity is a bit dicey because you can't clearly differentiate what's the cause and what's the result. So did they have like chronic sinusitis in the first place? And then, but then I also mentioned about a couple of papers that showed there might be an etiologic, you know, uh, uh, relationship between number of divings and number of flights and mucosal thickening. So that MRI studies, basically professional divers, the rate of mucosal thickening was and they didn't have any symptoms, like symptomless, professional divers, the rate of mucosal thickening was two times more than the normal population. So I think that's a very interesting study, but I, I could not extrapolate that, that chronic barosinusitis is something really separate from chronic rhinosinusitis. So it's, it's really, it's, it's hard to say, but um, something to consider. Yes? 
Um, thanks for that talk, Rosa. Uh, so I, I was going to just want, I wanted to make the point, which I think has been touched on already when we talked about the Jack Three thing, but a lot of the evidence that, you know, we went over to, to do this review, just for the, for everyone's, you know, um, knowledge, it's very low level evidence, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So that's just something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. That's why there's not a clear classification. A lot of this stuff is just case series or case reports. So to say something definitive, like for example, what we were discussing before, that a draft three is what you should do for frontal parasitis, is based on maybe you know one to four cases of someone doing that type of procedure. So um, you know that's not not something that we want to make broad sweeping judgments about. But certainly you can use that to add to whatever decision making you're doing in front. The other thing I was going to mention, going back to, back to Dr. McWallow's point, so say that you had a patient that came in that had a very clear history of recurrent acute erysinusitis. Every single time I fly, it's so painful, you know, it's the worst thing that lasts for a week and then it actually goes away. And then you get a CT scan, it's clear as expected, but you don't actually see those predisposing anatomic things that we definitely do associate with that. So then what would you do? Yeah. So I think that's a very good question. Um, so, so they recommend you, uh, you need to tailor your treatment, uh, but most of the cases that they're presenting, you know, in these series, they have some anatomic abnormalities. Yeah. I think that's a very good question. That's like that scenario, it's a judgment call. Yeah. You know, your endoscopy, you're getting a good history. Uh, how frequent this problem is. So it's, it's similar. It's similar to like recurrent acute sinusitis. Those are those are probably the most difficult cases to make a decision on whether or not to operate. Uh, so I think same rule applies here to these folks. Yeah. How, 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 how do you how do you go about this case? Yes, right? I would completely agree with that, and I think that really the the crux of the decision making lies in the conversation with the patient and you counseling them quite thoroughly about the fact that, you know, you certainly sound like you have this condition and you could certainly move forward with the procedure to try to alleviate that difficulty. But we can't, you know, we, there's, we can't predict definitively that this surgery is going to fix this problem. That's how I would go about that. You know, I, I think that I would have a much higher bar of doing surgery in a patient that I couldn't actually find some sort of anatomic predisposing something on the CT, and maybe I would, you know, make them try a lot more medical therapy or maybe try some other um, things for particular facial pain that got in those time periods. But you know, it, it is a quite clear cut history, so I think I would let that eventually lead me to surgery if the patient had the understanding. Yes. Excellent talk, as a just want to re-emphasize what uh, Zara said that I agree with 100%. In some rare cases, I've had some good luck with verapamil in these patients, these patients who have absolutely nothing wrong with them. I don't know the exact mechanism of it. Maybe they have migraine, maybe they just, they just need some vasoconstrictions, but uh, it's a very safe medication, so I would give them a shot of taking verapamil before flight, during the flight, one twenty twice a day, and larger. Just give it a try. We haven't done any studies on this, but yeah. I've had three, four patients like this, and for some reason they get better. So I think it could be placebo effect, but, but I think it has some issues with migraine. I also wanted to make a comment, you know, these airlines that we all fly, they, they climb at two to 4,000 feet per minute. Mm -hmm. So they're in a hurry to get up to 30,000 feet to save fuel. They're not going to stay at a low altitude. So they get the best fuel at 30,000. So they climb really fast. So then they adjust their pressurization to match their climb rate. So the ultimate pressure they reach is usually 8,000 feet in the cabin. The real good airplanes like A380, they pressurize at 6,000. But almost all, everything else that you fly is between 8 to 9,000. So sometimes they don't pressurize, they're not synced. You know, the guy is climbing at 4,000 feet per minute and is supposed to equalize the cabin pressure as it climbs, you know, finally they reach. So that's why some people get this and some other people don't in an airplane. So I think, you know, when I fly, I fly at 500 feet per minute. I climb at 500 feet because I'm usually not in a hurry to get up to the high levels and I could care less. But, so I try to minimize the injury to myself and passengers. The same thing when I come down, I come down at 500 feet per minute. So how do you get the United Airlines pilot? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. Because they got to go a long way. Yeah. 
I, I need to get to 12,000 feet. So for yeah. me, it's uh, 10 minutes, you know, 12 minutes of. Yeah, but you know, flight control tells them how fast. Yeah, they tell. So they uh, sometimes they descend when they're in a hurry and the weather is bad. They're coming now four to six thousand feet per minute, and you don't know that unless your ears tell you. But sometimes you know I usually have an altimeter with me on my iPhone, <laughs> and I know what the guy's doing. So I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> he's taking a dive, so I keep popping my ears. Hang on the door. So, Dr. Nayak, are you still there? I am still here. Do you have any comments on your paper? Yeah, um, I just have a just for one minute. Uh, um, sorry I couldn't be there in person, but uh, uh, congratulations, Grace, on finishing your chief resident talk. Um, uh, so everyone knows, uh, uh, there's about 80 references that Ray's had to look up, um, and they were obscure um, from New Zealand and book chapters found in Google Scholar, and um, and he found every each one, and he, he actually came up with that classification system as a, we proposed it in the review article based on the various case reports and the overall evidence, then we put it into hopefully that classification system that makes makes it a little more um, palpable or, or, or um, eas more easily understood. Um, and so hopefully that uh, was a contribution. But um, the other thing is that sometimes these patients, as you're hearing, they're very high functioning patients who have been through a lot. And so as long as they've done some level of medical therapy, my book, um, like the spider pilot, you know, he's got to get back in the air. Yeah. Otherwise, a lot of his career is, you know, or that part of his career, or they're about to deploy. It, it, all of that ends. Yeah. Um, or these these guys who are, um, you know, uh, you know, have already have three more flights and business trips already planned, but they're incapacitated. Um, you know, they need something now. And so, as long as they have some findings um, uh, on imaging. Uh, many times it's, and they've done some level of medical therapy and they've tried, or made a good college try, then I think it's okay. Um, at least, and also we're at Stanford, we have a lot of experience with this. So we're maybe a little more uh, ready to um, intervene. So, but like anything else, you want to make sure about uh, all those medical management uh, questions that were being asked. I think that's great. And um, um, if the person can hold off and try all those things and try the Afrins and decongestants first, Typically, that's, uh, you know, it'll build a relationship anyway, but um, but thanks a lot for the, the interest and uh, raise the congratulations. Thank you.